Oh my God. Do I got to get on Facebook though and do something right now? Yes. Yeah, so if you want to go to your page, you can set up a, uh, a watch party. Oh, I right. see. You tagged me in a post. I see. There you go. One second. I see. Hang on one and you second. See yeah, you see yeah, where you can add the post. Uh, yeah, and it'll I... it'll allow you to start the watch party. Well, uh, do I have to click on? Hang on a second. Two seconds. No problem. Uh, start watch party. I'm gonna click on start. That's it. Yeah. Hang on one second. Yeah, you yeah, see where you can... Add the post. Uh, yeah, it'll, it'll allow you to start. There it is. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. There we go. So now that we got the technology stuff figured out, I'm going to go ahead and just do a quick introduction for you. And uh, anybody that's watched a little bit of these uh, previous casts knows that I do not consider myself a professional in any sense of the word, but what began as an opportunity for me to share people that matter to me greatly in my life and share these people in my circle, my environment, because they've got interesting stories and inspiration. Um, I reached out to a couple of people that uh, have been remarkable in my life in many ways. And there are probably very few people that have influenced me more in uh, both uh, musical and professional sense, but also in, uh, in a personal inspiration method that uh, I like this guy as a human being. I think he's a great human. So I have with me the one and the only Glenn Sobel. <laughs> what a great endorsement. <laughs> <laughs> it, that, that will uh, mean all of about uh, a half a penny to your Vader stock. So <laughs> I, uh, I'm going to just say um, real quick, uh, Glenn's talking to me from his uh, quarantine in his uh, kitchen. And uh, what part of LA are you in? It's like the West Valley. OK. Right. Yeah, uh, that's my kitchen. I, I could be cool and be like in a studio with like drums and gear behind me right. to look like Joe Cool, but no, nah, it's my kitchen. That's what we love about you, man. If you want to whip something up while we're talking, you can certainly do that. Yeah, this is fine. A little Greek yogurt. Comfortable spot right yeah. here. I love it. Fantastic. Um, you know, I can this... reach in the fridge. The refrigerator is right here. This will be what during this if I needed to. This will be like the MTV Cribs, right? We can look at uh, your crib. We can see what Glenn Sobel keeps stocked at his fridge. Yeah, I can show you where the magic happens. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> your magic happens in the fridge. I like that. Yeah, good yeah. stuff. I like, it looks like you've got a really cute uh, Fisher-Price uh, cooler behind you, too. So this is... um. Oh, yeah. It looks it's like I'm carrying a kidney transplant in there. It's, it's picnic day. So bring to gigs. You got to bring cold drinks and snacks to gigs. Yeah. You know, real, real rock star stuff. That's, well, you are by far one of the most real rock stars I know in that. Uh, Not, okay, well, I'll, I'll say there's two sides of that, right? I mean, you're a legitimate rock star, but one of the most sincere down to earth guys I've ever met, which is why I think the world of you. So that's the whole angle here, man, is to share this kind of stuff with people. And um, I called it All Access Live because I really want it to be fun. I want it to be behind the scenes kind of stuff that people might not get if uh, they read an article or- What do you call it? What do you call it? All access live. Oh, all access. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, the amount of like, you know, all access slams and all the passes and stuff that we get, those kind of things make it feel like you're going to go back and hang with an artist backstage. But you yeah. and I both know that truly what happens most of the time is that it's a cattle call, walk back there, shake a hand. You might get to, uh, you know, look around and watch some artists uh, talk friend shop while you stand afar, you know, in awe of that artist. But truly, you're one of those guys that just takes the time to get to know your fans and your friends. And uh, from what I can tell, you've got a, a wide fan base across the world because you've taken the time to really get to know people. So, uh, well, thanks. Yeah, it's uh, it's good of you to to say that. Notice huh? that. Cool. It's, it's the truth, man. I I, uh, I can start a little bit with my first experience with you. You know, I wanted just uh, to mention my close friends know this, but. Uh, I have to give all props to Jennifer Batten for introducing us, right? Uh, uh, back in 2004, she moved to Portland and oh. reached out to me and asked if uh, I'd be interested in doing some gigs. And I eagerly jumped at the opportunity to do the, to do the gigs before I heard the music that you did with her. And as, huh. soon, <laughs> as soon as she sent me the CDs, I said, oh shit, okay, I'm in trouble. 
I asked her, who is this guy on this Momentum record, the Tribal Rage record? And she gave me your info. And I said, uh, all right, I got to call you and just, I need some shit and I need to come down there and get a lesson. And you were gracious enough to give me some time. But if you remember that first time, we didn't do a lesson. You chopped out for a little bit. I sat with my jaw on the floor and then just we went on to the town and really right. saw it, it became uh, much more, I think, of a, an inspiring uh, experience than sitting down and learning the chops because she never asked me to play it like you. And you were one of the first persons to say, hey, man, you know, just do your thing, you know, play the way that you would play. You don't that's have to be what's expected. And, yeah. That's what's expected yeah. on a gig like that. If it's yeah. a, a true musician that's hired you, they're not looking for note for note. They want to play these songs. You got these changes. They're looking a lot of times for your interpretation. It, it's such a fusion kind of gig. Yeah. So... I just, I don't even think when an artist plays their own stuff, they're doing it just like the record right. on many of the gigs. Look at what Jeff Beck does with his own tunes. Right. You know, they evolve, they change. And how did Jennifer contact you originally? She moved into town and hit up some of the jazz clubs. And she went to this place that is, is great, man. I was doing a lot of local jazz stuff and funk and fusion gigs, but they also brought in uh, national artists. And I think she talked to a couple of guys that had played with me before knew me around town and from what i remember she said hey i'm not looking for like a Caluda or a bozio clone i'm looking for somebody that can do more bonham i went straight ahead rock kind of thing and uh both guys referred me so when she called i said uh this isn't jennifer batten you know like i mean it took me so <laughs> out of context because i thought you know there's no way she'd move to portland anyway right and why would she find me but I agreed to do it. And that first gig was going to be the World Guitar Congress in Baltimore with serious cats, you know, John Schofield and Eric Johnson. And um, it, we did a couple of warm up gigs on it. And after playing with her, as you know, she was so much more than this world class uh, technical artist, but she's just a great hang, man. She's, I consider her family now, you know? Yeah, and absolutely. Yeah. She felt the same way about you. You did a great job talking with her a few days ago oh well. thank you great man you know because she really is just a, a, a real solid human being and a great friend she's become like family to me and um i think she when people when she allows people to get in close like that uh it's it's invaluable right those are the kind of things i want to hang on to yeah. and i feel the same way about you buddy i mean you, you you've meant a lot to me in a lot of ways and so i'm not going to gush over well, you like but oh. i um but I, I want to do this a little differently. I want it to be informal. I want it to be fun. We don't have to do this like a modern drummer interview. You know, I think um, there are a bunch of questions I'll ask you about the technical parts of the gigs and we can share and ruminate about funny stories along the way. You know, I think people can re relate to some of those things, but um, there's also some personal stuff. I want to ask you about inspiration and where you kind of derived some of that stuff. So you let me know where's uh, where we get too, uh, too close to home and I can back off a little bit, but uh, Back off, Kevin Rankin. There you go, ah, man. The, go ahead, uh, man. Well, I will say that first meeting, right? So we went on the town. You took me to all the haunts on the Sunset Strip. I had never been to the Rainbow. You brought me to my first experience at the Rainbow. I'm we hung sorry. Out. That was, yeah, man, it started a whole new fascination for me in the, uh, the 80s rock scene because it's everything I wanted from the 80s and never got there, right? So, um, and we hung out at the Roxy and the... Um, uh, I think we hit uh, Key Club and a couple of other places that weekend. And I remember watching your interaction with people. And uh, so many times when you're dealing with musicians and kind of working through this scene, there's so much superficiality, right? Everything is surface, man. You can never get deep with people. And you saw the whole ALA thing, people on their phones, like, hey, what's up, man? And, and just no real warmth and and um, vulnerability letting people in you know everybody was guarded and they had their wall up but i saw you make your way through the room everybody had respect and admiration for you and a lot of it had to do with your demeanor and the way that you made people feel and that was an instant um attraction for me that i thought there have been a few people in my life that I found that way in the industry. Uh, Dave Abrazis was another one for me that, that I had experiences like this that blew my mind, that he could be engaging and real with people and um, has, you know, he's experienced incredible celebrity status in the industry, but hasn't yep. let it go to his head, you know? 
Um, you deal with that a lot. You see people in that realm a lot. And I can see that you have made a perfect balance from what I can tell about being able to appreciate and value the time that people take to talk to you about, you know, like their experience or, or questions that they have for you. You don't make people feel like you're too busy to talk to them. And you're approachable in a really, a remarkable way that your musicality is next level, right? I mean, so many of us drummers look at your playing and it's, and I'm not trying to blow smoke up your ass, but you know, dude, you do these clinics and people are floored because you do stuff that seems completely impossible. And so much of that has to do with your talent and also the thousands and thousands of hours that you've put together, right? So um, the guys that watch you think, oh, yeah, I sit down for 20 hours and I could pull together a solo like that, right? It doesn't happen because you've done this for how long? What, playing pro? Yeah, even before pro, man, when did you first pick up a drumstick, set, a set of sticks? 11. 11 years old, so middle yeah. school. Yeah, oh, I definitely, I, I, I couldn't wait. I, I wanted to play. That was back in middle school. Yeah. Seventh grade, yeah, sure. And it was a situation that was, I, I talk about this a lot. People ask how I got started. It was in middle school. I somehow got placed in beginning music class. Like 15 guys at least wanted to play drums. You couldn't have that many playing drums. So we had to pick numbers out of a hat. And there was two numbers left and two guys left, me and one other guy. I picked the right number, like major crossroads moment. I didn't even know it. But yeah, that was Mr. No. Tremonti's, Mr. Tremonti's beginning music class at Hale Middle School. And I actually went back to the last wow. December and spoke to the class, which was really it's, surreal. Was Mr. Tremonti still there? No, Tremonti no, was still not, there? No, he's not. But the building is named after him. Oh, that's great, man. Which is cool. That's... And it was totally surreal. The drum set was in the same exact place. <laughs> oh, in the yes. classroom. Yeah. Did yeah. you sit down and you played for him? No, no, I didn't play. I was just there to speak. It was something that was part of a program that, that SAG does, the Screen Actors Guild something called VAPA, the visual and performing arts okay. uh, program that they do. Yeah, and, and a friend of mine, she asked me to come speak at Hale Junior High. And I had a feeling, I asked her, I said, did you know that I went there and that's where I started playing drums? She said, no. She's like, oh my God, you have wow. to come. Yeah. No kidding. God, yeah. when, uh, when you were there at Hale Middle, Middle no, Junior High, you drew that straw, you drew the number. So that, you know, that's interesting because I talk to people a lot about luck in the industry, right? Yeah, there's, there's luck. you know, I mean, honestly, that's maybe the one instance, right? Where luck actually dictated what happened with you in your, your career path, right? So you wanted to play drums, but at that point, did you see yourself doing this like forever? No. Yeah. No, of course so, so. My, my buddy, Jim Jelvig, he's a music instructor in, in the UK, but I went to junior high with him as well. And so he studies your stuff. He's a huge fan of Jennifer's as well. Uh, cool. he, he had a bank of questions, but that was one of the first things he asked was since he knew that you started studying in middle school, at what point did you feel like, man, you know what? I'm getting good at this. I wanna do this for a career. How long until you felt like you got to that point? I've been asked that one a lot too. You know, if I could pinpoint it to one thing or one time, it was, well, I'm born and raised in LA. So I went to my first NAMM show when I was 17. Uh -huh. And that, that weekend was probably it. Just meeting all these famous legendary drummers and other musicians, they have a lot of parties at night. Right. And you go, you watch performances one after the other, these great inspiring performances. And there was just a lot that went on that weekend. But I happened to meet Jim Chapin at one point. Wow. And people that don't know Jim, he was like a big band and technique guru. He would always be at the, the DW Drums booth with a drum pad giving like impromptu drum lessons on the spot. This was a permanent fixture at NAMM. The, this is the Music Industry Trade Show, the National Association of Music Merchants for people that don't know. But yeah, he would be there showing people stuff about the molar technique and all kinds of lessons. So at one of the nighttime parties, there was something going on in one of the ballrooms. There's a lot of concerts in the different ballrooms in the hotels. There was another sort of side room where people were just hanging out. And somehow I ended up in this small group of people and Jim Chapin was showing people things just with like sticks on a tabletop. Wow. 
And I had a pair of sticks and Jim was like talking about some hybrid rudiment. I remember what it was. It was the pair of flittle diddle, which is a pair of diddle diddle with a Swiss triplet in the middle. It's a very typical jazz ride independence rudiment. Hey, there's your phone. Yeah, sorry. Sorry about that. That's all right. So I had my sticks. I said, oh, you mean it's like this, right? And I just played something. And Jim said, just very briefly, he said, oh, you have very nice technique. And it was such a small, tiny thing, but it was that tiny thing that made me go, oh, wow. Like, maybe I can do this. Maybe I got something going on. It was the first time anybody of stature said something complimentary about my playing. It was just, it was on a tabletop. He probably didn't even remember it later, but yeah, that was a big, big deal. Six years after you started playing. So yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, so you're, you're 17 at your first NAMM show. I yeah. know those parties, man, at 17, were you able to get into a lot of those after hours parties because you had connections and people that you knew through the biz? Or? No, I didn't have much of any connections. Some of those parties, they were just kind of generally open without a ticket. You know, you didn't yeah. need to know someone to get in. They were just first come, first serve. Yeah, that wasn't restrictive to the uh, 21 and over crowd at that point. No, 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 not Cool, that. right on. That, uh, well, there's there's a jump in between 11 and 17 that we should talk about, right? So you, you were playing in middle yeah. school. Did you have any artists or anybody that came in in the middle school that was inspiring? I Glenn Sobel of that day. Visiting artists? I can't say I remember anybody particular. We always had great teachers and instructors yeah. that were part of the program. I can't remember any visiting artists that came in. That would have been nice. But Mr. Tremonti was at least inspiring enough that he wanted to keep you going. Oh, yeah. He progressed. And have you run into any other classmates from the day that didn't draw the right number that are pissed that they didn't uh, get that opportunity? <laughs> Well, I, I think I've been in touch with one or two of the other guys that I did play drums with in that original group of guys in beginning class. I mean, man, a beginning music class band director has to have a lot of patience. Yeah, big time. And yeah, Mr. Tremonti did. And then after that, in high school, of course, there was marching band mm. for all four years. And there was orchestra and jazz band and the musicals they put on, like Jesus Christ Superstar. I'd were play you, in a couple of those, yeah. Were, that was you, all, I, I didn't even realize it at the time how much that was great training for reading. You bet. And how to learn and sight read. My sight reading is not great nowadays because I don't have a need to do it. What I do all the time is I make charts and cheat sheets to learn songs. That is something I do all the time and I'm very in the zone on that stuff. But yeah, the yeah. reading of music was such an important thing. Were you in the pit on those musicals? Yeah, the couple I did, I was in the pit, yeah. Okay, right on. And then in marching band, yeah, and there, I'm sure. And there was like, it, yeah, it was like the first time I ever saw like mixed time signatures. It makes mm. you go, oh yeah, wow, you could have a bar of this and a bar two, four, a bar seven. I had never seen that before. And there were tempo changes and I didn't realize at the time what great right. training it was. Yeah, well, and even in the marching stuff, right? I mean, the ability to kind of get all limbs moving, right? So you're having to march yeah. and do formations while you're playing. Yeah. It, yeah, it really, you could see that that dexterity that you formed then really lends itself to the way you play right now, you know, with multi it, it was, They were amazing team building exercises because the marching band, you're doing this field show and there's literally over a hundred people on the field. There's the marching band that might be 60 or so, but then you've got the drill team and the color guard. Yeah. And there's a director up on a ladder with a megaphone counting out through the drill before you're even playing the song you're marching the drill you know forward for 20 left flank 24 right flank 24 while you got to be playing stuff right and we would run it over and over again staying after school school get out at three we'd be there till 4 30 or 5 every day oh yeah man you know not to try to one up that but try to do it in like two feet of snow in montana when it's no, 10 below that's, it. that's uh yeah that was enough to kind of kill my interest in marching band but uh yeah. <laughs> sorry that sucks no I, that yeah, sucks. i'm an la guy i'm yeah. born raised i couldn't take that would you uh you know what uh, this is jumping about a bit but you have been in la your whole life but you travel the world a lot has there been no. any place on the tours that you've that thought you know what i could imagine living here and and just uh considered setting up shop or even having a secondary house no no <laughs> no well, like well your bandmates i mean I, you got oh, well I, I will say i know you're really close to family right your mom and dad were incredibly supportive of you early on i would imagine it's tough to even think about being gone with them at home right yeah but nowadays it's made so much easier with things like what we're doing right now yeah just you could 
call, a phone call away, yeah. FaceTime and everything else. It, it makes it a lot easier. Yeah. I, I, uh, my, as you know, my, my, uh, my son is desperate to get to LA. He, he can't get to LA fast enough. And, uh, for me, man, <laughs> when I met you, um, I was kind of talking to you about this a bit because I wanted so badly to go to Musicians Institute the day I graduated high school. I wasn't going to go to college in Montana. I was just destined to go to LA. It was at the end, you know, the end of the real LA hotspot for the LA rock scene, right? So 1988, mm -hmm. my best friends split. They all went to PIT and I stayed behind and went to college and I regretted it for a long time. And now I have no regrets whatsoever. What really, you know, I mean, I, I love LA. I love coming to see you. I love coming to get gigs and, and do everything I can do there in a few days and then come back to the solitude of Oregon, you know, and uh, not have to deal with sure. traffic and, you know, but uh, back, back <laughs> to your family. One trade off here. You got to deal with, you got to deal with traffic. That's one of the trade offs of LA. Yeah. I, I, you know, your family, like I talked about them being real important. I know that your mom and dad both were really supportive of you early on. Uh, I'm sure when you decided to play at 11 in school, had they already hooked you up with a drum at home? Yeah. No, I didn't get a drum set until I had been playing for over a year. Okay. Yeah. Play, I had played on a pad? Yeah, drum pad first, of course. I mean, yeah. look, it just makes sense. If somebody don't get a drum set right away. You got to make sure that they have a genuine interest in that. Otherwise you get a drum set. It's just going to sit there collecting dust right. after a while once interest is lost. But yeah, I got a kit like when I was 12 is when okay. I got a drum set finally. Started at 11, got a drum set till till I was, not till I was 12. And yeah, and the neighbors found out really quick that I was drumming. And yeah, that's uh, every kid. Yeah, driving the neighbors crazy. And, but I bet your parents were supportive even then though, right? Because from what I've heard, your mom was letting you guys practice yeah. in your uh, in her closet, right? With Jennifer Batten Day. So she'd put up with this for a long time. Well, sure, yeah, when I, yeah. We did that actually. I had a practice space there at my folks' old house. And yeah, there was that, but just, yeah, me in high school practicing with friends in, in my room. I mean, this is what parents did. They, they know that their kids are doing something that's productive or creative, you know, not getting into trouble. You're, you're practicing with your friends. Does it sound great when you're just learning as a kid? Not necessarily, but they do it. And my, my first band in high school, there was two or three groups of parents that would let us rehearse in their house, but mainly it was one, it was our guitar player, Mike's parents. We'd always rehearse in his living room over and over. And I look back on that now, it's like, wow, they really put up with a lot. Yeah. Do you, uh, you, you stay know? in touch with, you stay in touch with Mike? Yeah. Oh yeah. All those guys from my first band, Bourbon Street, they are yeah. like, they're some of my best friends. Absolutely. Uh. In fact, I shared some video in the last week or so uh, of, it, of one thing I was telling you about this the other yeah. day. And I actually put up that little video clip, which is a pretty funny moment. Amazing, man. Yeah. The solo at the end of rock and roll. That was fantastic. Yeah. Well, it, the solo is, it was all right. It was just, you know, there's a guy, this is like when I'm 19 that this happened. The guy that was filming, it was filming the solo. If you haven't seen it, and he starts slowly turning the camera upside down and saying, Hey, Glenn, just like Tommy Lee, just like Tommy. Meaning like going upside down. And it was like a premonition of what would happen years later of actually filling in for Tommy Lee and Motley Crue. And I had forgotten that that had happened in that video from that party because I hadn't right. seen it in years. Yeah. And then finally, I transferred a bunch of VHS to digital and I saw that. I was like, oh my God. That's wow. Right. Yeah. 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 We're going to get to that story. Don't. Don't let me, you know, don't worry. We're not going to miss the, uh, the Motley Crue fill in story. No, but, no, no. I just, you know, you bring up about my first band. We, yeah. we played a lot of those songs. We, that was my first ever real gigs with a rock band. I was playing in that band with my best friends from high school. Bourbon street. Yeah. And are, the, are most of those guys still in LA? Um, yeah. One Mike is in near San Diego, but yeah, the other three of us. Yeah. We're out here. LA. Anybody else go on to, to do anything more? Uh, sorry, I interrupted you. I missed it for a sec. All right. No, we're, we're still in LA, most of us. Uh, yeah. Anybody else uh, go on to any notable bands or anything like that? Well, actually, uh, Wayne, our guitarist, he plays more bass now. 
but he's got a, a cover band. And funny enough, I mean, they work a lot. They play a lot of weekends, really great cover band. And there's this one crazy party that happens every year. They call it the spring jam. And it's always okay. obviously around spring, but uh, it, it's, it's at a friend's house. This guy is a good friend of Greg Bissonette's, my, my mentor mm -hmm. from back in the day. And somehow over the years, and I've only been to one of these, but somehow over the years at this party, it grew into this thing where there's literally five drum sets jamming with the band. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the band that plays at this is my friend Wayne's cover band. Okay. And they, they have to like lead five drummers playing at once. There's a video from a couple of years ago where there's like five of us playing hot for teacher at once. There's Greg oh. and here, <laughs> three other guys. And it was actually, it was pretty good. You can imagine that turning into just, just a mess. Yeah. But yeah. I've only been to one of them because I've been gone when the others have happened. But yeah, that, that was, that's what Wayne does now. Sure. God, that, that's cool. Man. That, you mentioned uh, Greg being a mentor of yours, uh, Greg Bissonette. Yep. You know, like a lot of people didn't realize how diverse Greg Bissonette's background was, right? They think about yep. his time and David Lee Roth and and not having a clue about his big band time and all the other gigs that he's done. But uh, how, how did you I, connect with Greg? It's funny. I just ran into him one day. He he lived in the West Valley out here in L.A. I ran into him at El Pollo Migo which I just had that for lunch today, actually. <laughs> Not El Pollo Loco. This is El Pollo, El Pollo Amigo, an independent store. Okay. And he just walked in one day. I was having lunch. This is back when I'm 18. I recognized him. I said, hey, you're Greg, right? And we just started talking. He said he gives lessons. And I hit him up for lessons. And these were group lessons. It was like yeah. two to four people per hour. Okay. And Greg's dad, Bud, would be there yeah. uh, collecting the money and, and handling all the logistics of the lessons. And it just happened to be that he was he was giving lessons at this guy's place, Jay Rubin, who was a drum tech. Jay had like a basement, two drum sets down there. This guy, Jay, lived right across the street from Cal State Northridge, where I was attending at the time and living in the campus apartments. Okay. Yeah. And so wow. me and my roommate, Mike Dubin, also drummer, he also plays guitar and everything. But we were both way into drums. We both were doing private lessons these group lessons with greg at the time so we'd wake up early on a saturday morning maybe hung over from the night before or something <laughs> drive across the street and do these lessons with greg and those were just invaluable wow man and how old were you then 19 18, 18. wow uh, i know that during that time too you mentioned some other shows that you saw like you'd go down to the baked potato and see like bozio gigging and some other cats like that all the time tell, tell me about that I mean, that to me all right somebody that's not lived in la but people that you know, you pop into LA and it's kind of like a, a tradition, right? To bop down to the baked potato and just see who's playing because there's always cats. But oh, it's, yeah. it's almost like a home to you, right? You're there all the time. But yeah, man, that place, I call that place always like it was school. Yeah. It, it really was. I mean, the first time I ever went there, I was 16. It wasn't 21 and up. It never has been. But it, it was uh, back when I was 16. And it was Richie Morales playing there, who's playing I was really into. The guy played with Spyro Gyra right. for years. And a really, for me, influential record called Breakout, which uh, had some great drumming on it. It's funny, too. One of the main tunes from Breakout was the song used on our high school's, like, news program. Okay. You know, so every week I would hear the Spyro Gyra tune in 7-4 broadcast all over the school but that's a whole nother thing but i realized how great that place was the baked potato because we literally me and my friend mike dubin we sat like five feet away from the drums oh man and and you're just getting this lesson watching yeah. all these guys that watch jeff percaro there uh tom breckline vinnie coliuta like all the time back in the like he'd play there all the, so often he'd play there it wouldn't even be packed always because he was always playing there and i would God. go and i'd stay for both both sets sit on the side of the drums and just soak it in guys like that yeah, I mean, he probably started he recognize you and sort of uh take you under his wing you'd see that this this young protege is there watching this stuff and did you guys make some connections that way did i well you know at the time i was studying with greg so i'd see him play there and maybe you know the following lesson the next week i could ask him about something that he might have played yeah i got to know a few people back then tom breckline very underrated player used to watch him all the time and just so many more so many players and and then later 
in later years getting into 20s, 30s, I started playing there a little bit. And yeah, it's like the hub kind of. Amazing. I've seen it's so many It's the size clips. of a living room. It's the size yeah. of a big living room and it's known all over the world. I've seen great video of you playing like Danny Carey, you guys doing like the Volto double drum thing, right? Well, that was that was when I subbed for Danny. Last oh, okay. Year. Yeah, this was a fusion band that Danny had. And at the time it had Kirk Covington. Oh, wow. In the band too. And Kirk is like this just ridiculously talented, gifted musician. You know, people know of him first usually as a drummer. He played on all those right. tribal tech Scott Henderson records, but he's an amazing keyboard player. He sings, he plays flute, you know, just oh, amazing. Wow. So Kirk's main role in, in that band was playing keys and singing a little bit, but then he had a little three piece kit off to the oh, side. Wow. So the, the gig would involve a little bit of double drumming. But yeah, one night, this is back in 2009, uh, Danny Carey got sick. He had the flu. And so I got called last minute to sub the gig. Last yeah, it's, on, it's on YouTube. Some that's, of that. That's so crazy that a gig like that, it's such an intense gig. There's so much going on in that gig. How do you just call last, get the call last minute and walk in on a gig like that and actually make it slay? Well, what they, what they do at the time, I mean, it transitioned. That band Volto started out doing a lot of fusion covers. Okay which a lot of them I kind of was familiar with or knew or maybe had even played stuff like Quadrant Four by Billy Cobham off the first Billy Cobham yeah. solo record. That's the first double bass shuffle of its kind. Wow. That Alex Van Halen later did. But yeah, stuff like that and some Weather Report stuff. They had some originals. A lot of these songs, if you learn the form, you were pretty okay. You know, it okay. wasn't a very heavy arrangement with a lot of unison stuff, a little bit, but okay. yeah, we were able to get through it doing that of course i had to make charts of everything and that makes it kind of interesting when you're just going for something the first time in a improvisational situation yeah you might get some magic moments out of it flying by the city of your pants man yeah you you don't show up to that gig loaded right no. <laughs> i um i think uh well we can we can touch on some of that i mean some of this improv gig i mean some of those things that um you walk in on a gig and Danny Carey just calls you last minute because he's sick, right? So you do that kind of thing. You've had some of these opportunities where you've had to fill in last minute. You've also done a lot of like auditions and some of those cattle call gigs. And um, I, I guess I want to touch on this a little bit, but one thing that would question I had for you was maybe that um, a close call, like something that you were really wanting to go after a gig and I bring this up because I, I read uh, Mark Shulman's book, right? He talks a little bit about uh, going after the bad English gig and oh. his audition, right? It's kind of a, it's a pretty famous story, right? He walked in and, and uh, I think uh, uh, Jonathan Cain threw a metronome at him, said, go practice with this and come back another time. And huh. he was, he was humiliated, you know, tail between his legs, went out, and started shedding and uh, Dean Castronovo came in and got the gig. But that was a life changer, game changer for Shulman. Were there any opportunities like that, that, were pivotal in your development of your professional career? As far as auditions go, I, I can definitely say there's been auditions I've done where, you know, I didn't get the gig, but I felt like I was a better musician after having to learn all that stuff. Yeah. Like auditioning for John Fogarty way back in 04. Really? You know, I could have been the youngest drummer there auditioning. I mean, at the time I thought, yeah, maybe I'm too young for this gig, but I had been recommended there was a short list of people and I showed up at the audition and there were definitely drummers there that we've all heard of and and it was actually it was pretty cool even though I didn't get the gig I felt like I came out of there playing the best that I could have and and Fogarty looked at me and after we played Green River I think it was and he said that was grooving I thought all right you know I'm happy because he's he's hard on his musicians right in, in a good way yeah. in a good way but it was just a blast playing through all those songs. It wasn't this short thing where you play one or two songs. They gave everybody a list of five songs, I think it was. Okay. And you'd play through all five. And then he had an additional rhythm guitar player that he had to audition. So I stayed in for another second round of those five songs. It was in there a while. And I, I felt fine about it. And I remember John Molo got the gig. It made sense. John Molo would play okay. with Bruce Hornby. I didn't have uh, as much of a track record back then. Right. Different pedigree. Well, yeah, sure. The, the, but the, the, I felt that, like I feel, you felt like what? That? I'm sorry. I just felt like I was better for it, better for the experience. Yeah. Good. I, you mentioned the pedigree thing because I know that's when I first met you. That same time, 2004. 
you're uh you had a pedigree that at that point that was primarily hard rock <laughs> metal metal stuff man you had shredded doing chris and pelletieri stuff and mcalpine you've done some stuff mm -hmm. right and uh uh, tell us a little bit more about that transition, right? Because to that point, guys knew you as a killer metal drummer. How'd you develop that? Uh, that yeah, well, like the McAlphine. The McAlphine gig. It's like a metal, what that was. And that, that thing that Greg Bissonnette had recommended before, the situation where Greg called me one day after hearing my drums demo tape that I made. Okay. And I guess it was the first time he had ever heard me playing in a context with people. Uh oh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, you froze for just a second. Okay, no, no problem. How are we now? Yeah, we're great. Yeah, yeah. So, all right. So, your drum yeah, demo McAlpine, tape. McAlpine was like, uh, metal fusion gig i was saying and greg had recommended me after hearing my my demo tape he heard me play in a musical context for the first time possibly and yeah i got the gig and it led to other similar gigs in that genre i guess you could say it's like shred guitar or yeah. that sort of yeah that that metal shredding thing problem was this was like the early 90s when I, right. when I got that gig. And this is exactly the time when it was not cool to be doing that style of music. It, yeah. it, the grunge movement, it didn't just kill hair metal and all that. It, it killed right. shred guitar. Right. And I knew it at the time. I was very well aware of, oh my really? God, timing, you know. This, yeah. But no, I was, so, I was so happy to do the gig. And that record I did with Tony called Madness, that's still one of my favorite records I've ever done. And uh, it was just great. Branford Marsalis was a guest on one of the tracks, yeah. which is my favorite track on the record. And it was just a, it was a great experience. And so that led to the next gig in a way, which was playing with Chris and Pelletieri. And, and that's a band that it has a singer, but it's really guitar heavy rock. It's metal. It's hard rock. There's shredding going on. And at first someone told me he was looking for a guy and I thought, yeah, okay. But that whole thing is not happening. What, what are they doing? But then I saw, Chris himself, Chris and Pelletieri on the cover of Young Guitar, the Japanese guitar magazine. Oh, right. I, I just happened to be in Tower Records one day and they carried a lot of import magazines. And I saw that. I said, oh, well, I guess he's doing well, really well in Japan. Look, he's on the cover. I'll go and I'll jam with him. And then uh, we did quite a few tours of Japan and we did some records. Yeah. Wow. That, yeah, that was early 90s, like 91, right? No, no. When I started, I got the Tony gig in 92, late 92. Oh. Okay. And I started my first tour with Chris in Japan was February of 95. I remember this stuff. I got wow. this calendar in my head. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, no. Yeah. That, that calendar, you know, well, I guess at least um, that the typecast stuff you got nailed with, right? You were playing this this guitar metal for a long time. And, yeah. and as you transitioned into audition for gigs, like the Fogarty gig, uh, had they been aware of... Much yeah, yeah. But when you've gone into auditions like that, they were aware of your pedigree. They knew that that was a past that uh, came and followed you, right? I don't know. Possibly. I don't know what they were aware of gigs like that. But yeah, in the, the 90s, there was definitely those kind of gigs. Because then after Impelitary, there was Gary Hoey. Right. Which was a guitar instrumental gig, although he had some commercial success at radio. Yeah. With some songs. Yeah. And Jennifer, of course, which is yeah. one of my favorite records I've ever done. And But I knew at the time, it's like, I said to myself, yeah, I can't just be this guy. Right. I, I like I like too many other styles of music. And I actually started playing in this pop punk band with Tommy Hendrickson. That's where that came from. All right. Yeah. That I had known him already, but we had never played in a band until then. But it was great to just do something else. Yeah, you know absolutely. Like. Absolutely. You know, but, yeah. Um, you know, so Tommy's development, uh, your relationship with Tommy, then when did that start happening? The pop punk, ba punk band was when? Well, that was 96, but I had met Tommy in like 1990. Okay. Actually, yeah, I met him way back. And the funny thing is, another instrumental trio I was playing in in 95, 96, just around LA, was with DJ Ashba. Oh, right. God. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and actually, I have old video from that, too, that I just kind of unearthed and transferred the video to digital video. But yeah, that was an instrumental trio and the bass player, Bruce, in that 
told Tommy Hendrickson to give me a call about his pop punk thing. And Tommy said, oh yeah, I know that guy. And so we started playing just around town with Tommy's group. This was POL Parade of Losers. It was on, <laughs> it was on giant records. Really? I mean, okay. Like, like a New York version of Green Day or something okay. like that. And it was just great to play like at the Roxy, something like that with a four piece kit. And just having people go, wow, I'm really surprised to see you on that gig. It's like, yeah, hello. I'm not just one dude. Right. You know, people are going to, they're going to label you quick. Big time. Yeah. In this business. So it's up to you to kind of prove yourself in every genre. And the band didn't ultimately have success. The record deal was lost. But for me, it was, it was a great experience. Just, just playing that and showing people I played it. And then, of course, Tommy became more of a producer and got me on a lot of sessions. That led to a lot of gigs for you, right? This relationship with Tommy. I mean, uh, you want you want to talk about his connection and how he brought you into the coop fold? Yeah, well, obviously that was many years later, but Tommy had produced a lot of things. There was this artist on Arista he produced that I did the record and a lot of other things. So in 2010, Tommy got me on a recording session in Nashville. He was living there and he was working with Bob Ezrin, the producer who okay. produced Alice back in the day. Right. And the, pro the project they were doing was, <clears throat> they were doing re-records, meaning like Alice was going to re-record Schools Out, No More Mr. Nice Guy, a few of the original hits. Okay. And the, que the question always is why? Why do that? What's the point? Well, if a movie, TV, or video game wants Schools Out or one of those songs, now there's this newly recorded master tape of this where the artist re-sings it and studio guys come in. I had to make note for note transcriptions i do it exact again this is where reading comes in handy but yeah the session went well enough and i had known of bob's reputation as being yeah. hard Kid. on musicians yeah yeah and that session had reb beach and greg smith on it and it was wow. it was a lot of fun we had to replicate the 70s tones you know the drums with the tape and the tissue paper yeah. to get that dead sound you know it, we had to recreate the 70s and we had the original producer there it was it was a blast wow. And so we did that and it went well enough to where a year later they asked Bob Ezra to produce the show. And he had some ideas about a lineup change he wanted to make. And he suggested me to play drums. And uh, Alice said, wow. well, you know, I heard him. I said, this is Bob's recommendation. I never... What's that? What's that? This is Bob's recommendation for you. Right. Yeah. Okay. He suggested okay. me to do that. And, uh, well, basically Alice said, I sang over his tracks, but I've never met him. I never met Alice. It's common when you're a session yeah. player, you don't meet the artist you're playing for. Right. And so, and so Tommy was there in the studio, whatever they, they were like mixing Alice's latest studio record. And so I guess Tommy pulled up some YouTube to show Alice, well, this is Glenn. This is the guy that played on your re-record songs. And based on that, I guess Tommy pulled up something of me doing something showy. Yeah. Uh, and then Tommy vouching for me going, yeah, Glenn's cool. He's not an alcoholic. He's not crazy. Yeah. Alice said, okay, yeah, that, that's the guy. He, he's it. And Tommy called me in LA and I was still asleep, of course. Oh, of course. Two hours earlier. And he, he, he's going, yeah, yeah, I'm here with Mr. Cooper. And yeah, he's a New York guy. And, uh, you know, we're, talking, we're looking at your videos and you want to do this, take this tour. And I was half asleep. I went, yeah, man, let's do it. He went, and it was basically that. That was it. I, I met Alice on the first day of rehearsal. Yeah. Really? Wow. Yeah, I, did, I didn't, didn't meet Alice till the first day of rehearsal. That was funny. God, man. You've told me some crazy stories about how supportive is, he is to his bandmates. And yeah. for me... Um, I think, you know, as a music fan, people always want to hear about the wild and crazy times of, of things that happen on the road. For me, I'm always blown away by positive treatment that an artist might have with his band, right? I've heard great things from uh, our buddy, Mike D, that's playing with, you know, Halford, and he was doing that whole Halford gig with your buddy, Bobby Jones, uh, Jars and Beck. Yeah, Mike from Dramarama, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. Uh, but he, he just, he, uh, he he's just got great things to say about Halford and the treatment that he got with the band. Rob is cool. And and yeah. you've said the same thing. I mean, the, the Coop has done some remarkable things for his his family in the band, right? Yeah. But is it, the, things that you take for granted if you just don't see those things. So so tell me about some of those things that Alice has done for you guys. Well, 
he's just he's just a great boss. He, he's always in a good mood, and he wants his band to be featured. You know, and it's surprising at an Alice show how many minutes he actually is off stage because of a costume change or something like that. I get a drum solo, yeah. and uh, Nita Strauss gets a guitar solo, and then there's a whole section at the end of the song where all the guitarists are up front doing this. We're doing this instrumental section. You know, there's all these songs where there's all this this timing that has to be worked out for him to do the costume change and we're doing our thing and he says you know if you're being featured if you're in a solo spot within a song or on your own you are alice cooper and you have to get out and represent oh that's cool and, and that's how cool it is you hear about other gigs that i won't name but the front man tells certain people in the band you know you don't come up in front of the stage unless i'm there too or you know, you don't take your shirt off until I do you know, <laughs> yeah. all kind of things. And, you know, just just rules. And of course, there's rules on it on every gig. Yeah. No doubt. But yeah, he has a good time with it still, which is great to see. Yeah, man. He's very active, right? I've heard he's out golfing every morning. You guys are on tour. Yeah, pretty much. Got so like he he gets there ahead of time, goes out, finds the links. And uh, doesn't Chuck go out with him? Is right? Is, yeah, our bass player golfs them a lot, and Ryan Roxy golfs with him an awful okay. lot. And right. yeah, it's all set up ahead of time. The golf uh, resorts and the courses, it's all part of the itinerary for him. Okay. And they're they're more than happy to host him, and sure. they'll have like a bunch of people golfing with him. And then at night, we'll see certain guys dressed a certain way. It's like, oh yeah, those must be the guys that golf with this <laughs> They show up with their golf shirts and their little uh, berets. And <laughs> you can just, you can tell who it is. You yeah, yeah, yeah. This is not the, this is not the typical Alice Cooper fan base. This is a, uh, this is golf fans. Yeah, but they are, you know, there's a lot of guys that, you know, were, were into them back in the day or into them now and they happened to shoot nine holes yeah. that morning. He's a legit player too, right? He's not just like some hack, man. The guy's got chops. No, right? no, he's he's serious, you know, and he's done a lot of these celebrity golf tournaments. And I think a lot of the pro golfers are like genuinely like, whoa, this right. guy can play. He's not just some like rock star that plays a little bit. He's the real right. deal. Yeah. yeah. He could walk he off fast. He could walk off stage and just smoke most people on the planet playing golf. Yeah. Yeah. That's great, man. I uh yeah. Um, you had talked a little bit, I think, about some some special treatments where he'd he'd lock down like a day for you guys to hit movie theater together. Is that right? Did I remember that right? Yeah, yeah, we've done that a lot. Like going to the movies on a night off, and if he's going out, he'll yeah, he'll foot the bill, which is very cool. He loves movies. I love movies, so yeah, it's another good reason to be on the gig. You know, That's, yeah, it's a it's a good getaway when you're on tour. It's a good thing to sort of break up the schedule a bit. You bet. Do something different. What's the last movie you watched with the Alice Cooper hang? I don't know. I can remember a lot of movies we watched, like World War Z. I remember we oh, all went. Shit. And just just a lot, you know? Yeah. A lot of different things. A lot of movies. You uh, I think um, some of the, I, for me, I know touring, my memories of like tour experiences for me it's not just the experience you have on stage right but there's so much time that goes into transportation to and from the gig and you got yeah. a, day, a day off you know some of those days off where you get to travel i know that you like to to get out see some of the the, the sites and, and you're traveling like in asia and europe and that kind of thing you yeah, that's uh, what you get, any, any you places get that you can think of that you and coop got together where this any place special that you can think of a that place you got, where we Together, yeah, sorry. There's there's a little internet hiccup there. Sorry, buddy. I'm sorry. Repeat the question. I couldn't hear. You. Oh yeah, I was wondering if there's yeah. any place that you can think of. It was an off day or a spot that you guys hit that thought, you know what? I wouldn't have been here if I wasn't on a tour with Alice Cooper right now. And that experience with him just makes it that much cooler. Is there any place that stands out to you? Oh sure. I can't think of one right now. I mean, there's just been so many. Just. Just a lot of great experiences. You're talking off days. Yeah. Um, yeah, just like going to some of those like gimmick golf places like Top Golf. I remember we had a sort of tour party there when we were out with Hailstorm and Motionless and White last year. Okay. And we were we were all hitting balls off of this. It's like a driving range, but it's like this game, like a, a giant game of pool or something, but it's golf and you're driving balls out into the range and trying to get them in these big holes, you know, for points. Yeah, the target. Just great times like that. Sure. That's cool. And he's just, he's uh, generous out there. He's out there 
Like, I mean, I, if I remember it, he's he's sober, right? He's a, he's a, he's been sober for quite a while. Oh yeah, yeah, a long yeah, time. yeah. So he's not out there pounding beers with you guys, but he's out just uh, enjoying the party. Otherwise, yeah. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And just all the the dinners that we've had on these package tours, where like. 17 it was deep purple and alice and edgar winter and there, there's always like a dinner there's like usually maybe a dinner at the beginning of the tour run where everyone kind of gets to know each other if they haven't met and then maybe there's also an end of tour dinner that's good cool. and those are those are a blast you know sitting down with like ian pace and people like that and just talking about whatever yeah music drums everyone is pretty cool the drummers the drummers always seem to, to get together and hang which is yeah. great well, you you know you've got that going on everywhere, man. I mean, at the Nam show, there's a uh, you know a wave of drummers that just kind of follow you from booths that you're signing to events at the end of the night. You know, it, it's uh it's kind of neat to see the entourage that kind of follows you around. But you uh, <laughs> and then you've got like this uh, 818 like coffee and donuts kind of thing you had going on with, with the drummers. The drummers right? lunch. The 818 yeah. drummers lunch. We actually did one back in January, the week of Nam. That was the first time we had done it in three or four years. Oh, but really? it's something, it's something uh, Jordan Burns, who might be watching right now, he lives right by me here. Him, me, and then Dean Butterworth, who I shared a drum practice space oh, wow. with for years. We used to go to lunch because we all live in the same area. And then we'd say to another drum buddy too, hey, come down and meet us at Stonefire Grill. It just, it kept growing. And it turned into an actual thing where we put out the invites and Modern Drummer even covered it one time and God. put it in the magazine. Yeah. And this last one we did, I, there was like 50 drummers at Stonefire Grill on like a random Tuesday afternoon wow. where we get, the, we get the whole outside patio. We arranged it ahead of time. And the other people in the restaurant are going like, what is going on? What's going on? <laughs> Guys dressed in black and what happened to Stonefire? You know, it's right. It's got to be weird for them, but yeah. No, I'm sure Stone, Stonefire probably appreciates having that much uh, attention brought yeah. their way. Yeah, but, sure, of course. Uh, man, these other experiences on the road, I just, I keep thinking about things that you've shown and talked about and told me about. This uh, Jordan just commented, I think, on Facebook. He uh, said something. Uh, oh, yeah. Let's see, I'm looking. Right now, I just saw another note. Uh, Dane Haas is asking uh, when you're going to be coming back to do lessons out of my garage. The... Uh, no, people that people that don't Who know asked that? Uh, Dane Haas, my buddy Dane, he's done a lesson with you here. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, I I'm blessed to have your uh, your old Apex kit here, right? So when you did the um the yeah. Alice, that Alice Cooper tour a handful of years ago, I remember you bringing us up on the uh, Dane was with me that day, hopped up on your riser in Tacoma, and you were showing off your that my identity kit, right? You had the black satin spider eye finish with all the red hardware and you had the, yep. the, the spider web bass drum lugs sure. and, and uh, it was really funny and serendipitous, right? That like a year later, I ended up owning that kit from the guy that won that thing. And um, so it's been fun. Yeah, you bought it off the guy that won it through the modern drummer drum set giveaway. That's right, yeah. <laughs> I, I called, I called wow. you to say, dude, this is crazy. I found your kit on Craigslist for next to nothing and i remember you asking me what is it like some tweaker or something <laughs> trying to, and i said no he's a he's a legit he's an airman he's working with the uh, army and uh he travels from base to base and he just couldn't keep traveling around with that kit so he was selling it off and he Perfect. actually he brought it down to me in an ar army truck full of parachutes and so like your, your drums are stacked on top of these parachutes that he's driving to arizona and uh brought it to the house and uh you know you've gotten a couple of night days of uh Full days of lessons in, in my garage with some some uh, my buddies that have been blessed to get to hire you for uh, for one on one sessions and it's fun to have you come in play on your old yeah kit. that was great thank you very much for hosting me those couple of times that was really oh, cool dude I I think the last time I was even on the road right and I just gave you the garage code and, and oh, I, yeah. I think you came in and um at, you know for my friends that have had the opportunity it's a really special thing you know and for me I, you know, my house is your house, man. It's nice to be able to have you here, but- uh, That's why Kevin's the best. No, Thanks. man, it's it's truly, I am I feel like when you meet people in this industry, so many people are superficial and they're out for, they, they have ulterior motives for stuff. I just love that when you find somebody like you and my circle of people that I care about that give back a lot, you know, and, and I see you do this a lot. You do a lot of education, even online where you're giving the goods away. And I know it's important for you to be able to have uh, a mix that you can monetize and sort of um, get both students in and uh, work uh, um, 
uh, sessions where you're doing some recording and right now your name is out there right people know Glenn Sobel man they're be, they'll call you for sessions and they'll call you to sub on gigs and um, but at one point when you've been at first got to meet each other you had been in that typecast thing right where everybody expected you to be the metal guy and I remember yeah. talking to you you were doing some auditions and I remember it being difficult because you had to walk in and kind of disarm them by taking down the stereotype and say hey you know I'm not just a double bass cat man you know I can play time and I can play pocket and the thing that I saw that was really transformative in that era was when Alice started doing the New Year's gig in Maui, right? Where he'd have um, the New Year's party and did do that jam thing. Every year it was primarily, I think, like Steven Tyler, right? Michael McDonald and, yep. and, and uh, Alice. Uh, but you also had these other celebrity guests that you were doing these songs like Sarah McLaughlin, you know? And, yep. and you'd, ha yep. you'd, ha you'd have to pair the playing down where it was all about the song. And it wasn't showy, it wasn't crazy chops, but at that point, people that were pivotal in the industry, they could see, or the premiere in the industry, they could see, man, this guy's not just a pretty face. He's not just chops guy. <laughs> you know, this guy can play whatever it takes, right? And, and uh, I was really proud of you at that point and proud for you because I'm protective of you as my buddy, you know, because I know that not only are you capable of doing all those things, but I didn't like to see you taken advantage of by some of these cats that maybe, um, didn't appreciate all the things you brought to the table and uh you know that that stuff happens so you always got to prove yourself in mm -hmm. everything i mean you could be highly recommended for a gig and it still doesn't mean anything there's always got to be a little bit of skepticism yeah. by the artists you know even if they they've seen video heard you play they still aren't 100 percent sure that you're going to come in and nail their material so right. you got to realize that going in yeah you got to definitely you got to definitely show them that the right choice was made so you got to be over prepared but yeah those gigs in maui every new year's those are great that's alice's manager shep gordon that's his charity event that happens every year and now we've done nine years in a row in maui nine. wow and it, it seems to get crazier every year it, it's always it always has a lot of the people that live there that are featured like steven tyler and weird al and the Doobie Brothers guys, Pat Simmons, Michael McDonald, and uh, God, there's so many. But then, then there's other like last minute guests. It always seems like at least one person gets added last minute. Like in in last December, the last minute guest was Paul Simon. God, wow. He uh, we did one song with him. It was last minute, and it was Diamonds on the Soles of Her Shoes on the Graceland record. Beautiful. Which, which was just it's a cool fairly easy song you just got to get the right vibe and and uh we had andres ferrero on percussion for that he's been doing wow. these too he's the drummer from hamilton on broadway okay he's he's amazing and he's a very okay. very good buddy of mine now and it's great having percussion he plays drum set too on the gig but it's great having drums and percussion especially for a, a stuff from paul simon or stuff right. by even michael mcdonald's solo material having the congas on taking it beats by the doobies yeah or long and running ad so much and we get to play linda carter join us every day. linda carter and cool uh, did we freeze up here just for a second but you were talking about the linda carter thing yeah you got me are we yeah. back yeah we're back i got you yeah, yeah. wait i lost you Bro, are we good I think we're good. Yeah, can you hear I'm me back? all right? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, we're having a little bit of trouble here. Yeah, like the uh, yeah, I have, I have a feeling that yep. uh, the, my internet bandwidth is just being choked because everybody's trying to chime in on questions about uh, your gigs. But uh, uh, the, the Linda Carter thing is just funny and fascinating because that's so bizarre that she'd be part of it. She sings. Yeah, she sings. Wow. Great. she's great yeah she's yeah she comes with her family we we have her all these last three or four years jim carrey got up to really? schools out with alice and us once yeah wow did you, hang and, with, uh, did you hang with jim a bit a little bit yeah. yeah yeah he was actually he's actually very cool he did it with alice makeup on and that's oh. back when he had the, the beard so yeah. it looked freaky yeah. yeah and all all with this the king stuff is on, diamond all this stuff is on youtube what's that Oh, it looked like King Diamond a little bit with the, the beard yeah. and the, yeah. 
Yeah, something like that. Uh, it's so many other people. Mike Myers has gone up to sing with us. We did a Austin Powers tune with him years ago. Uh, Sammy Hagar, Richie Sambora. Um, man, yeah, we just go on. The Sambora thing. We don't have to talk about that and what happened <laughs> on that gig. So there, there are things I'll leave out to protect uh, friendships, right? Well, I, I ended up playing with him. It was great, you know? Yeah. And uh, it was when also we had the thing going with Orianti and we did right. some Brazilian dates and some other stuff in the States here. And it was something I was able to do when I wasn't out with Alice. Alice right. being the main gig. But doing the Maui thing was a very fun house band gig. I'm sure, man. It's probably a because it's at the end of every tour, right? I know that you have you have uh, your tour typically ends up in Phoenix, and then you do the Christmas pudding thing, right? Where you get the benefit. Yeah, the tour doesn't necessarily end in Phoenix, but that's Alice's charity event that happens okay. every year in like early mid December, and it benefits his him and his wife Cheryl Cooper. It's their Solid Rock Foundation okay. for kids, which is great. It's it's the arts. It's music and it's dance and it's it's for all kinds of youth, keeps them off the street, keeps them out of trouble, gives them something really productive and creative to do. It's a great organization. Mm -hmm. So we play the benefit for that. And that's another thing where I've become part of like a house band thing. Like, uh, yeah, backing up a lot of different people, like Rob Halford doing a Jewish preset with him. Mm -hmm. We've done that a couple of times, backing up Sandy Hagar. Uh, just a lot of great things where you go, wow, how did this happen? You, you uh, sorry, I lost you just for a second there. I was trying to uh, to look at some of these questions that people had while you spoke about that. But that's usually the week before you go to Maui, right? So you get a few days off and you get a a, a tour. Well, break. It, it's like yeah, yeah, yeah. And Coop like flies you over to Maui and just gives you a little break from the vacation or break on vacation while you uh, rest up from the tour. Yeah, we're there for about a week at wow. least. Yeah. Nice. That's a good time. It's like a little sort of bonus vacation. Plus, we have that gig that's on New Year's Eve. Yeah, that's that's fun, man. The uh, uh, you know, like I said, I wouldn't talk necessarily about what happened with the Sambora thing there, but we can talk about how you got the Sambora gig in the first place. Well, it was basically, you know, Orianti was a part of the Alice Cooper lineup starting in fall of heaven. And she was in the band for about two and a half years. And just through that, I started playing on some of her solo gigs and recordings along the way. Okay. And then when she started doing live gigs with Richie, what ultimately became RSO, that was the band they put together. I did some of that as well when I was able to. That was it. Okay. Right. Like, but you so you did South America and uh, US stuff? Did you lose me? I got you. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? We may end up, uh-oh, I did lose you. You're back. Hey, buddy. Here, let's see. First I got the you. internet, I hope you didn't hear that. I, I, I see you, but you're sideways. Um, so let's see, this, uh, this might, there we go, beautiful. Wait, wait, but let me, uh, there we go. Awesome, very cool. Okay, this, is this the same feed or are we on a whole new? No, nope, same feed. Yeah, okay. you, just, you just drop for a second. So uh, still looks like Tin Kitchen. Yeah, um, so so the uh, the uh, Sam like Sambora thing you had South America, some U.S. states, and then has it been just like sort of on hold now while you just continue to tour with Coop? Um, well, I don't know. I mean, he's working on a new record. I heard, and uh, I haven't done much else with him yet. I haven't in a while. But yeah, the Alice gig it definitely it it keeps us busy. So to get other tour dates in between it's not always yeah it's not always possible it, it works out once in a while schedule wise you know but between that and now hollywood vampires you know it's two separate touring gigs that have to work out the schedule between each of those so sure got a lot of moving parts in those gigs the sure. uh before we go into the vampires thing i definitely wanted to talk about some of the things that happened along the way one of the tours you did was uh alice cooper motley crew right yeah. So, so uh, you had some experience with some of the cats from Motley, right? I think you did some work with Nikki back in the uh, 6 a.m. days. Yeah, I did the very first 6 a.m. live gig, sure. Okay, and then uh, some experience with Mick Mars as well, right? No, I never did anything with Mick. 
okay. beforehand. No. So I am. Um, why not? I, I could set it up, and this is what I knew about the gig that you guys had. Uh, you were doing quite a few dates together, um, and during that tour, Tommy had developed some issues with his hands, right? Uh, oh, we got you freezing. Yeah, uh, yeah so um, yeah. I didn't hear your answer there, but Tommy had some issues with his hands. So he'd been saying to the guys, hey, look, I don't know that I can continue this tour. And the tour engine that's going on can't really necessarily just take this time off, right? You've got guys in the band and people that bought tickets and people are expecting this money to be coming in. So Motley can't just say, yeah, we're just going to cancel a bunch of dates because Tommy's got some issues going on with their hands. So what do they do for but to handle the Tommy situation. Well, that was a situation where I just got called in my hotel room suddenly one day. We were in Buffalo, New York, and uh, the production manager for Motley, that was a guy I had met like way back when I was playing in Beautiful Creatures. He was a guitar tech with Marilyn Manson, but he was known back then as this like premier guitar tech guy that was just always on top of everything. He was like a legendary guy in that field. And so I wasn't surprised years later to see him as production manager for Motley Crue and for Kiss. Okay. So when he called me saying, asking if I could fill in for Tommy Lee that night, I thought it was a joke. Right. At first. I said, all right, who's messing with me? Come on. But he assured me it was for real. And that's how that happened. I said, all right, get me to the venue. I need to get a board mix on a thumb drive so I could sit in one of the offices, a production office at the venue with my laptop and make a, Make a make cheat sheets of all the songs of the set. This is day and of gig. It was a mathematical hours, huh? This is the day of the gig. What's that? That you're asked. Day of. Okay. Yeah. So he calls you up in the morning. Said, "Hey, we need you." Like, um, did he say, "Are you interested?" Or did he say, "You, you got to do it." Well, of course, he asked about doing it. I, I said, "Yeah." I a couple things similar to that. The most similar being filling in last minute with Vasco Rossi in Italy in 2010. Right. I mean, Vasco is like the big he has by far. I mean, it's right. stadiums and arenas. And that was a last minute thing that I had filled in on. Wow. It, it, uh, so you said yes. You've got a few hours to prep the gig, write your notes. And? Right. And uh, no time to rehearse with the band. Get a sound check? No, there was no, there was no sound check rehearsal. Nobody was doing that on that gig. Even the day I played that first show, I got up on stage and the two drum techs, Tommy's tech and my tech, they were able to rearrange my set and scale it down between. And so they had to figure out how to do that okay. during the day to take away all the stuff on the left and go to one rack tom, which I do all the time now. But uh, yeah, once they got that figured out, I went out on stage and I just dialed in my in-ear monitors with their with their click tracks and the count-ins and making sure that it was dialed in with their monitor system and that rig. It was amazing how it all sounded so different. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The different monitor rig and the different PA settings and everything. Yeah. God. And there's a lot that goes into that gig. It's not just that you're playing the parts of the song, right? You've got a lot of theatric stuff happening, you've got py pyro and... Well, there's there's like bombs going off right next to the drums practically it's yeah it's God. a loud crazy gig there's a lot of fire a lot of pyrotechnics we we had pyro on the alice gig but their pyro made ours feel like little firecrackers after a while <laughs> you know <God. laughs> but i had a music stand up there the whole time and tommy lee was able to talk to me in my in-ear monitors for cues but i didn't want to rely on that i wanted to have the music stand with the, the stuff charted out. I've got my system of doing it. So I treated it like any other gig and they have clicks on every song. The whole band gets the click and the whole band hears the count offs. Really? Okay. Well, yeah, every, everything is programmed into the light show. Sure. There's a, guy, there's a guy named Viggy that designed that system that syncs up the lighting, even some of the pyro with what the band is playing. Like, you know, uh, Primal Scream, it could be like boom, gap, doosh, da, 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 and on that fill, the lights do that in okay. tandem with the fill because it's all programmed in. Right, that's it's pretty great. amazing. Wow, but uh, 
and you'd seen the show because you've been on tour for a bit had you sat through entire yeah. shows watching the song so at least you knew somewhat of the arrangement that they had put together and some of the dynamic sure. things were happening all right so so just it was your notes it was the memory that you had from these shows and then you just were sent up to the wolves and you did a bunch of shows right like five yeah a week worth of shows yeah five god that's amazing man what fun you know the questions that everybody wants to know are like you know how financial stuff all happened with that and we don't have to go there unless you want to no, we worked out a good deal yeah. good yeah you were taken care of oh yeah part of that was your negotiation if i remember right yeah sure and look it's like the show's got to go on right and they didn't have to fly anybody in or put them up i i happened to be there and the fact that we were on tour and I was hearing the show, even hearing it through the walls. We were in our dressing room, we're just chilling. You know, how many times are you gonna watch the same show? It's a highly entertaining show, no sure. doubt. But I'd even hear it through the walls, like boom, some pyro thing. Oh yeah, that's that pyro thing in Primal Scream or whatever. You just yeah. start, little things would sink in. Yeah. But that, you definitely gotta know the songs. You can't rely on anything. You gotta know as right. a drummer what the arrangement is. And some of the songs, man, they are tricky. People sometimes, don't give a band like Motley Crue their fair share of credit, but like Wild Side. Yeah. It, it's it's harder than you think because it's kind of different every time it comes out of the chorus. Right. You know, or Dr. Feelgood, it's it's a heavy tune, but it's really syncopated. Right. You gotta get those pushes and those downbeats just right. Right. It's it's things you have to think about and you have yeah. to nail the uh yeah, there's there are a lot of moving parts today. And let's preface this by saying um, there are some internet things kind of going on right now. I know personally, like I want to try maybe and save a second part of an interview for you because there's a lot to get to. And uh, and so I'm going to try and get uh, our, our internet stuff dialed in. If we can maybe table some of the conversation for the next call, we can do it next week. Sure. But yes, sure. let, let's talk about the, the most interesting thing about that even though Tommy had this configuration set up where he was doing his roller coaster drum set that rolled and did the flips. Tell us how about your experience and how you got to go up and do that during the day. Yeah, I didn't do it during the show. Right. But, but yeah, I had subbed a few shows and I was talking to Tommy one day back by the dressing rooms and I said, you know, I just got one question. Can I get a ride on the drum set coaster on the coaster? He goes, oh man, you got to try it. And so yeah. we, we arranged for me to come down early one day when they were all setting it up. And I did the whole 10 minute run through where it goes all the way across the arena to the back behind the mixing board, the front house. And then back. And it's me riding it. Oh my God. Hey, Glenn, if you're still there, I, I, I lost the signal in the most pivotal part right there. Uh, so I'm wondering if uh, it just right now, maybe uh, my internet provider is saying, hey, man, you're just chewing up too much of our bandwidth for this exciting show. Uh, so, it's so, frozen. Yeah, uh, we froze up a bit. So we missed the really exciting part of your show. So what I'm gonna do is that's like the cliffhanger. This is where we're gonna actually table the conversation for the second part of the show. So let's do this. All right, he's coming back here. We've got a- There he is. Yeah, I think, you know, I, it may be that uh, my internet provider is just choking me out. I, it seems like if I got, a, I got a good signal here, but I keep losing you. So this is, this is the perfect so time. Have you missed like every answer and everything I've said? Have you missed like half of it? There have been a bunch at the very end here that have started to drop out. So yeah. I think, um, so let's do this. I'm going to table the second part of our conversation to like make sure that we've got a good signal. Uh, these are good cliffhangers, man, because we're right in the middle of the roller coaster ride. And we're going to talk a little bit about the experience you had with Motley and then lead into the questions that everybody seems to be asking about the Hollywood vampires, right? Yeah, that's sure. A, that's a big deal. So, um, so let's do this. Um, I'm going to post uh, some links to some of these cool videos in the thread of this, uh, this share where people can see some of the, um, the uh, uh, Bourbon Street clips that you've been sharing, your old school gigs from your first band, and some of the uh, roller coaster antics that you had in the Tommy Lee 
uh, uh, drum seats. And then um, if you've got some other socials, I want to make sure that people know if they if they're in the area and they can do any kind of Zoom lessons or instruction, any uh, any sessions that you're doing and available for right now, where we get a little bit of a break in the pandemic. I want to make an opportunity for you right now to be able to pimp your wares, you know. So, <laughs> how can people get a hold of you to uh, to book you for some? Stuff? Well, it could be on through Facebook or whatever. Are you still there? Did I just lose you? I think I lost you again. Where'd you go, Kevin? Hey, we're not having much luck today with this. Uh, I don't hear you. I can't hear you. How about now? You got me? Yep. Yep. A excellent. I dropped you on that one because that computer just died. So this was, uh, again, this is like the perfect transition time where we get to, to pimp your wares a little bit and talk about uh, ways that people can connect with you for sessions and lessons and uh, maybe find out about what um, Alice Cooper Band is doing right now to spend their time during the pandemic. Um, so do some sharing in the thread of this Facebook event so we can get your socials down there. And uh, are you available now to do some Skype or Zoom lessons or anything for people? Yeah, I've been doing a little bit of that. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Good. Uh, and what's your plan? I, I know that obviously none of us can speculate about when the, uh, when touring things are going to come back up again. But uh, do you have uh, a plan for keeping the band active and productive and constructive? Oh, yeah, yeah. We got some internet things we're planning, the Alice Cooper Band. Okay. The things we're working on. And there's some other things that, that we have done. We did a cover of the, the Stooges tune, Be Your Dog. That was before. killer. Yeah. And there's Tommy, something, si Tommy singing that one. Yeah, yeah. And there's something else I'm involved in with another large group of musicians, something coming out in about a week and a half or so. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's a common thing these days, doing the multi- picture the split screen kind of collaboration yeah yeah it's good man you got to stay busy and uh it keeps you relevant right yeah it's it's a lot of fun to do actually it's that's, a new world it is a new world man i'm glad that you can adapt and shift because that's what we all have to be able to do uh, sorry for the the technical snafus i think you know those are bound to happen every now and then but i would love to uh let's get a part two together for say this time next week and we'll look at your schedule and see what you got available because um, there's a lot to touch on. I want to talk about some of the funny gigs that uh, we both uh, both been at the same time. I want to get in the Hollywood vampire stuff. My uh, sure. my uh, my friend Sarah Jelvig and uh, over in the UK is dying to know about it, your time with Johnny Depp. And you know, most women want to hear about that stuff. I'm sure. But um, the uh, so the next time that we can get together, let's talk a little bit about that and what you see for your future. And uh, and then in this thread and put your socials down there, any kind of links that we can get a hold of you to, uh, to be able to book you. And um, I just want to thank you, man. Thank you so much for your time, buddy. It's great to catch up. And I, uh, you know, people that have gotten to know you over the years that have, you know, that have gone, I've known that I've said, hey, look, you've got to meet Glenn. You've got to see him play the shows. He's not just an incredible drummer, but he's also a wonderful human being. And so I'm- uh, uh, Well, the check is in the mail. You're too cool. Dude. It's not an ass kissing session, man. I wouldn't tell you if you didn't, if I didn't totally believe it. So yeah, you mean a lot to me, man. Thank you for this. Hey, no problem. I just had to show up in my kitchen. Yeah, it's nice. <laughs> and it wasn't uh, El Pollo Loco. What was the other place that you said you were just chowing? Oh, El Pollo Amigo, the friendly chicken. Friendly chicken. Oh, nice. That's Not us. the crazy chicken. <laughs> nice. Fantastic. Well, you can take me there the next time we go. And uh, I want to jump in. I want to be 8 drummer lunches, you know? Yeah. I'll change my zip code as soon as we can. We'll have to do it virtually. Yeah. It'll you take know? a little time. That's all right. Yeah. But uh, anyway, man, please, uh, you know, just uh, give, my, give my best to your peeps there. And uh, let's plan a time for next week so that we can, uh, we can catch you. And um, have, a, have a great uh, great week, man. I hope things are good, good for you. You got it, brother. I will see you soon then. Real soon. Thanks. Sounds great, man. Good yeah. talking to you, buddy. Thanks again, Glenn Sobel. We'll All talk right. to you, folks. All Take right. Care. Thanks, man. Uh,